So we've got the uh, the big uh, fur that came down uh, in last video, the the windfall. Here's the deal. Uh, I was thinking about that, it, and that it, because it's so rotten and so punky, it really doesn't have any value for firewood to us. So I was thinking of a way. How can we use it other than just burning it? You know, the obvious way in a in a way that would be. Uh, uh, well, beneficial, right? And so then I got to thinking about those, uh, oh, I don't even know what they're called. Is it like a, uh, a, a Hugen forest or some German, strange German word, German name. And what they do is they take these rotten logs or even new logs, dead trees, and they bury them in the ground in like a trench. So you take a backhoe and you dig this trench and then you plant different things on top of it. And that log is basically an incubator. For whatever is you want to plant, you want, what you want to plant. And I thought, well, that'd be perfect for this, right? Because it's uh, it's long and straight, and it's dead, and it's no good for anything. If we could set it aside and use it this spring, so we'll uh, I'll process this whole log. It's a big one, you know. It's a hundred footer, uh, and it's probably sixteen at the base or so. Uh, very differently than we did the last one. Uh, using, of course, you know, the Anmar and the Frostbite, we'll be able to handle this whole thing and, and I won't have to even get out of the cab apart from just bucking it into length. So yesterday, we loaded the family up and went into town uh, for Jack's uh, science fair. He, he participated in a science fair. Um, it was a really, we, we homeschool, you know, so we, our curriculum is a very traditional curriculum. And so the kids were uh, required, kind of like a senior project, I guess, in high school, were required to put together um, something, you know, that they wanted to do, do use the scientific method on, you know, repeating uh, the experiment three times and documenting everything and, you know, verifying all that stuff. So it was really good for them. Funny thing about it is, I mean, it was, you know how you warn someone, you know, we were like, Jack, this is coming up. This is coming up. You know, you need to get this done. Are you getting this done? And of course, you know, and it's our own fault because Mrs. W and I are both procrastinators. And it was, uh, so of course it was all hands on deck, right? The the night before the science fair and putting together the poster board and all this stuff, we were scrambling around. I don't think we got to bed until like ten o'clock, and that we were kind of beating ourselves up about that and thinking we were bad parents and you know we should have helped him you know get stuff going earlier. And the funny thing about it about it that there were some parents that couldn't even come because they were up all night. <laughs> So, I saw a lot of really tired parents. I saw a lot of science fair boards that were probably not done by the kids themselves. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was just hilarious. You know, it was that, it's, the, it's the human condition. Sometimes you think you're all alone. And that every, if you were to follow Instagram, you would think that everyone has a perfect, shiny, beautiful life except for you. But it's not the case, you know? All that stuff is fake. Most of what you see in these videos, you know, on YouTube from different creators, I mean, of course, do you not paint yourself in the best light? I mean, you, you, you can't, you're biased. You're biased against yourself and you're, you're going to do that. Some people worse than others. Um, but it was hilarious uh, that we were all in this together and we got started talking about it and you know, oh yeah, we didn't get to bed till 2.30 in the morning or we didn't get to bed till four. You know, it was hilarious, but uh, the kids did great. Uh, Jack did really well and we were really proud of him, but uh, that, was our, that, was our, that was our day yesterday. So I think these Hugen logs are correct. Someone put in the comments what those things are called. I don't remember. Uh, I'm gonna make. Let's make them about 10 feet. It's so densely wooded in here. It's hard to to skid out sideways. You know, log sideways with a grappler that are too long. So we'll just make. We'll make them at tens, um, and then we'll uh, stack them all up for the spring. Got in big trouble the other day in the comment section. It was a huge scandal for me. I got caught on video wearing gloves that didn't have grommets in them. So I made sure that we didn't uh, make that mistake again. My granddad used to tell me, if you're sitting in a cafe with a bunch of your buddies, you know who, how you can tell who the real logger is? I said, no, granddad, how can you tell? He says he's the one stirring his coffee with his thumb. I know, it's not exactly an original thought. I think he stole it from Johnny Cash. But tell me, what in our lives have we not, have we not stolen from someone else? Is there really anything original anymore? What's the last original thought, original thing that you've done? Truly original. I'd have to think about that. So the question is, what's the best way to deal with this? I guess we know we're going to cut it to 10 footers. Do we leave the limbs on or do we limit here and then pick up the limbs here? Now, I think I'll take, leave the limbs on it. It's so brushy in here, it's, they get all tangled and it's hard to pick them. 
let's just leave them, leave them on there. We'll take them up to a big open field and then cut them off. Then we can scoop them all up with the tractor and we don't have to do anything. I like that idea best. I can't help but laugh at myself here that I feel this desire that I have to take my tape and uh, mark off these 10 foot sections so that everything is uh, symmetrical and in uniform, even though it makes no difference because it's gonna be buried in the ground. It's so funny. I, I would never have done this uh, before, but now I find that I'm, I'm, whoops, I'm drawn to this, uh, oh, my thing came off. I'm drawn to this uh, uh, idea of symmetry and things being in order uh, like I wasn't before. And I wonder what the, you know, I wonder where that comes from. Is, does everyone kind of experience that with age? Because I know some guys that are young that have always been that way. I mean, they just are constantly obsessing about organization. You know, I'm not to that extent, but I like to have, I like it not to be chaotic. I don't want a chaotic life. I think that's, that's what it is. And I wonder, you know, is it the closer, the longer you're friends with God, is it, you know, you become more and more like him? I mean, do we not kind of, if we hang around a particular person that we admire, do we not oftentimes take on some of those positive character traits of that person and the, the adverse effect as well? Uh, if I find ourselves around some, some unsavory type of folk, I had a couple folks ask why I don't like to wear those uh, one piece chainsaw deals. You know, the helmet with the earmuffs and the face shield all brought into one. Uh, because of my vanity, I guess, because I, I, I want to look cool. <laughs> no, it, no, it's more than that. I, I, I do like, I like the tradition of the metal, uh, the aluminum hats, uh, you know, from this area, you know, being a, a, a north, northwestern born man uh, so I like that tradition part of it um, I like the freedom of it um, I guess what the main reason I don't wear those big one-piece things I actually have two of them they're pretty good uh, is that they don't seem to hold up too hard on stuff I I can throw my metal hard hat into the back of the tractor the tractor bucket but those things that they're so delicate all the I think I have two or three of them with various pieces broken and missing off of them so the re reason why I don't wear them is just that I haven't found them to be durable enough uh, or I just am too much of a ham, ham-fisted uh, barbarian uh, to, or, to deal with it. Maybe that's more, more of the case. So this right here is the chain brake. Most saws are gonna be pretty much standardized this way. And the way this thing is designed is that uh, forward always locks it out, or it should always lock it out. And the saw is designed to be cut, always having a hand right here on the top bar. One of the biggest concerns for new users, inexperienced users is kickback, meaning the speed of the chain is so fast if you were to come up against something and not have this supported, it would kick back and it can hit you in the face. This is designed to trigger in the event of a kickback situation. So if you see the saw rotating like this, it automatically wants to shut itself off uh, as it comes up. So it, in the forest service, if you take a saw your qualifications class where they will uh, you know, test your skills for two days to see if, if you can be a class A, B, or C faller, uh, one of the things that can be an automatic fail uh, is removing this hand or, or, ha or not having a hand, you know, sliding a hand around here to the side during the exam. They want to see, uh, they want to see the hand over like this in this position at all times just to catch that safety. Uh, but the tip is, is it's a good idea uh, when you're moving, a couple things when you're moving with a saw is just like anyone that's had uh, firearms training will know that finger needs to be off that trigger. So when you're done cutting, for me, it's just automatic because I always look at it like, you know, very similar to a, to a firearm, is my thumb comes off this. What that does is if I'm moving around and I trip and fall, your natural inclination is to grip or to squeeze in stressful situations and you can squeeze that throttle on you can fall on top of the saw and you can be killed or, or hurt really badly so by i'm done cutting my fingers off that straight just like our discipline from firearms get in the habit of doing that the other thing is engage the chain break and learn how to do it without having to take your hands off the saw uh, all these saws with a little practice you can learn by tipping them up and rotating your wrist you can engage that break just tipping it up 
rotating that wrist engages that brake. It's a very simple, very simple motion. Some saws are more ergonomic than others, but you can typically do it with a little bit of practice. So the process is this, is if we, especially when you're limbing, most of the close calls that I've had, the times where I've gotten into my chainsaw chaps have been clearing brush. Uh, and tripping and the saw moving around, rarely is it on cutting something like this. So get in the habit of uh, get have a good a position to st a stance, uh, make your cut, and then let the speed of the chains, chain uh, dwindle to nothing till it stops. Don't engage the brake while it's still spinning, it'll tear up the brake. And wait, and then with a the finger off the trigger, engage that brake. Now go ahead and make your move. And when you're ready, you just have to pull this back, put your finger on the trigger, and you're up and cutting. But that's kind of the process. It's some people will say that's not reasonable, or it's a little bit, you know, it takes too long. It could be, but um, I, I try to practice it as a rule. He runs, you know, the chance of me getting hurt go down when I work safely. Of course, you know, you can't. Some situations you can't, but that's kind of kind of good practice to get into. What are those logs called? We'll just call them Fritz logs or Hans logs or I can't think of anything. Fritz logs. That's the best I can come up with. Could have been worse. It could have been Adolf logs. And there I go again. Mrs. W told me not to remind the Germans about the war. They get so sensitive about that. Have I ever shared with you guys the way that my grandfather taught me to walk in the forest? The way loggers walk at loose jointed, rolly walk that keeps you from falling down on wet logs. I'd do that if I haven't already. It's really, it's one of those things that, you know, could be picked up for guys working in a particular environment for a hundred years that is lost. That's one of those lost things you probably never hear about anywhere again. I have really enjoyed that, having that chainsaw mount in there. It's been the Handiest thing, one of the handiest things I've built last year. Ooh, the old sun's coming out. It's gonna be a pretty day today. I like, this is my favorite winter. I prefer overcast because I do video work and overcast, you know, makes the, the best, uh, it's always the best light, that beautiful diffuse light. But uh, this is my second favorite. Although it plays hell with the camera of being in bright sunlight and then in shadow. But, uh, so here's what we'll do. We'll launch the drone. And uh, it, I like to use the drone for getting the tractor footage because it's like having a mobile tripod that you can control from the cab. Uh, I always, I do all my own drone flying and I, sh I film it and do everything all by myself. So if you, you'll see sometimes when I'm driving the tractor that I'm actually flying the drone at the same time. And for that reason, I've crashed a lot of them. Most of the crashes that I've had have been while I was trying to drive the tractor, I think. must admit that the hairpiece is looking good today. Kind of a conservative look on the side and a little bit of a little bit of a devil may care in the bangs. That's a nice thing about wearing toupees is that you're not stuck with the same old haircut. You know, it takes a long time for your hair to grow out. This way you can just go on Amazon, you can order something a little bit different, you can change the color. I mean, it's I don't know why more people don't do it. It's just there's some sort of a stigma against it. That and fanny packs, I just don't understand. Um, but I don't care. I, I, I'm going to be a trendsetter with, when it comes to the, uh, the artificial hairpiece. Anyway, so some folks have been, uh, well, some folks have had some current concerns telling me in the comments uh, that I'm, I talk too much in videos. And that's probably the truth. You know what? I was thinking about that. And, um, you know, you come into, you come into different seasons of your life, right? And, uh, now after doing, you know, doing our homesteading and stuff for, for coming up, I guess on seven years or better now. Uh, we were kind of in a different mode than we were back then. We're kind of more in a, in a maintenance mode. Back then, it was um, all hands on deck. Uh, it was There were fences that needed to be built. There were uh, forests that needed to be cleared. There were orchards and gardens to be planted and infrastructure and all of these things that needed to be done. And it was a lot of, was a, that, a lot of time was spent doing that. 
now that those fences are built and the trees are trimmed and the forest is cleared, a guy's a lot, uh, I guess you kind of get back into more of a maintenance mode um, and, and not so much uh, uh, just, you know, going hard all the time. Um, and so, you know, of course, the video content's going to change as well. And, you know, and I'm kind of in a, I guess I'm in a, an area of my life where, where you've got to make a decision. Either you, uh, you move on to something, um, a homestead or a piece of land or something, and, and you build it up and you make it nice. And the desire it is not to rest on those laurels, but the desire for a lot of men, active men, is to go and do it again and maybe even do it better next time. And so you come to a point in your life, like here, you know, do, have we brought the land up to an, a place where it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to maintain and maybe less of a challenge for us? And do we, do we sell this to someone else and start all over again and do it maybe even on a bigger or a grander scale? That's the question. I mean, my, my granddad worked for, as I said, two companies. He was a mechanic for Ford his entire, his whole life, two companies. And he only quit the first one because they wouldn't let him go elk hunting. So when he retired, uh, he wasn't retired for very long. I mean, he sat down in his chair and watched some TV and, and you know, did what he, what he did. He went back to work almost immediately. And, you know, partially for the money, but partially also, I think more importantly, was to, to have a purpose in life and to, um, and to ha- have a reason for living. And I think that that's the reason why he went back and was able to work and, and to do to, to have something to take pride in and a purpose uh, helped him to live uh, a long and prosperous life. He was elk hunting into his 70s, late 70s, if I remember right. That's pretty good, isn't it? So uh, you, a guy reaches a point when you get to, so what do you do? Do you, do you move it on, pass it on to someone else? You know, most Americans only stay in houses. I think the last statistic I heard was for seven years. And, and I think, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, that's, people don't move that much, do they? Well, we have. We've actually moved more than that. So um, I think that it's probably very, very accurate. So uh, I guess the, let, let me, I think what wraps up this whole conversation, this whole decision uh, is, a, is an old story I know, and I'll share it with you. So there was this guy. He was a farmer. He was super prosperous, right? He had so much abundance uh, that uh, it, he wasn't able to even fit it into his barns. And so he said to, said to himself, well, I know what I'll do. I'll, uh, I will uh, tear these bars down and I'll build even bigger barns and then I'll, I'll, you know, then I'll enjoy the fruit of my, my labors. I'll enjoy my abundance for a while. But as he continued, he was never content. He was never satisfied. And as, the, as he was continued to prosper and had more and more and more, he continued to tear those barns down and to build bigger and bigger and bigger. And he never really got to the point where he was able to sit down and enjoy the fruit of his labor. And the, the sad ending of the story is, you know, as the, the Lord comes to him and says, uh, you fool, don't you know that this very night your soul is required of you? In other words, he, he died in, 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 in the process of building bigger and bigger and bigger without the ability to enjoy it. And that, uh, to us, that old story is a lesson. It's, I guess a guy's got to, it's different for everyone, but a guy's got to figure, decide what is it I'm content with? What is enough for me? What is, what is a big enough house? What is a big enough, um, what's a nice enough car uh, for me uh, to be able to sit down and enjoy the labors of my hard work? Because society's telling us, uh, you know, if we're not doing something, if we're not pro- productive, especially as Americans, that there's almost something wrong with us. You know, why aren't you working? You know, you even get, even get it today. You know, I don't have a traditional job per se. And so I'll be in town and inevitably, you know, someone asked me, a cashier, somebody, so you got the day off today? You know, it's, it's unusual, it's strange in this community for a man to be out doing something that wouldn't be work-related, maybe not in work clothing uh, for most people. Uh, that's changing, but, but it, is, it is certainly there. So you were raised with that mindset. So I, I think, uh, you know, for me, I, I'm enjoying this video content. I'm enjoying uh, if it takes me all day or half a day to go get... Um, uh, a dozen logs out of the forest with the tractor, you know, that's, that's okay. So be it. And if we only film half of that or, you know, if we don't really accomplish a whole lot, that's okay too because we got to hang out and we got to share experiences and share wisdoms. And that's where, I guess that's where it comes from is that that's the way it's always been is that you've worked with an older carpenter, right? And he doesn't do the same type of work that the young apprentice does. The young apprentice is 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 humping 
trim and up up the the uh, stairs and he's unloading the deal and he's putting tools out he's doing all those things that hard labor work uh, because he doesn't hasn't reached the point in his life where he has a skill that makes his time more valuable doing other things does that make sense uh, and so they're both working, but they're doing very different work to accomplish the same goal. So I don't know, maybe we just move on to that. And I, the nice thing about it is when you get into your 50s and 60s, you, you, you have enough experience that you can actually be a benefit to someone to share wisdom or knowledge or tricks or what has worked for me or what has wrecked my life uh, and don't go down this road. Um, and that's one of the cool things about, uh, about YouTube is to be able to, to do that. Now, whether or not a person is going to listen uh, you know, that's, that's where we always fall down. You know, the, there's no short shortage of good advice, uh, on YouTube or good advice in the world. Um, but we seem to cho choose not to heed it. We need to learn our own lessons, uh, the hard way. It's funny how you remember those hard lessons though, isn't it? I should tell you about the time, the hard lesson where I spent the day out on a mud flat in my jet boat. We probably had enough to, enough video today. Well, thanks for watching, and we will. Um, I was going to show you that uh, crazy ch chain, chainsaw deal that uh, with the spikes on it. Maybe we'll catch that, catch that next time. Um, still got some more cutting to do out there. I'd be curious to see if that's a a go or a no go, a gimmick or uh, or something that's actually useful. But I'll uh, I'll bring that up here pretty soon. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the thumbs up if you enjoy these videos, and we'll see you on the next one.